the ranking member, Ms. Plaskett, for her five minutes of questions. Oh, can't do that. We're done, Mr. Sauer. He's on his way. Oh, okay. He's walking right now. We'll stay. The committee will suspend. I didn't look up. There we go. Apologize to our witnesses. We had some, some votes, but uh, we'll, be go, we'll uh, now uh, turn to the ranking member for five minutes question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, before the break, our colleagues were concerned and accused the Democrats of refusing to condemn something that we have no actual facts about. The case is beyond our uh, factual rec understanding at this time, and what Republic uh, other than what Republicans have told us today. Thanks to a long and exhaustive examination by the January 6th committee, however, we do know for a fact that the Jan January 6th was spurred by President Trump, who used disinformation and violent rhetoric to egg on extremists and conspiracy theorists. And Senator Schmidt and Mr. Landry, the two witnesses who were dismissed before their extreme and false claims could be tested under cross-examination, played an active role in that. They were a key part of the Republican Attorney General's Association, which sponsored a robocall urging people to come to the Capitol on January 6th. That's what they were here for in their role as Attorney Generals during that time. My colleagues, Ms. Wasserman Schultz, attempted to play that call earlier, but technical difficulties prevented her from doing so. So I have asked that we can play that now so that everyone can see and hear exactly what Mr. Landry and Senator Schmidt did and the violence and chaos that resulted. Calling from the Rural Law Defense Fund with an important message. The March to Save America is tomorrow in Washington, D.C. at the Ellipse in President Park between E Street and Constitution Avenue on the south side of the White House with doors opening at 7 o'clock a.m. At 1 o'clock p.m., we will march to the Capitol building and call on Congress to stop the steal. We are hoping patriots like you will join us to continue to fight to protect the integrity of our elections. For more information, visit marchtosoveamerica.com. This call is paid for and authorized by the Rule of Law Defense Fund, 202-796-5838. We just witnessed what was just given to us right now was real evidence, facts. We just witnessed our very real crimes and violence that erupted because of what these witnesses' actions did. If they had been here, I'd ask them about that. I want to know also, and I'll yield time, to see if any of my colleagues would like to condemn the violence of January 6th. Not just the violence of all things that are happening in America, but the violence on January 6th. Did the gentlelady yield? Are you going to condemn it? It's a yes or no? Yes. OK, thank you. Same here. Same here. We all have, they, on record, many no, times. No, you not all have not, and we know that. Oh, wow. But yield, reclaiming my time. So Mr. Landry's appearance before the committee today gave him free publicity. We know that he's running for governor. And the chairman's decision to dismiss him in his role as attorney general before questions means he can't be held accountable for the efforts to overturn the 2020 election. Another, well, Jelly, you'll no, I will not, not okay. at this time. Okay, thanks. But one of the things I would ask him about is other things that he was involved in with Donald Trump. As you can see on the screen, this is testimony given deposition of General, uh, the Attorney General Barr. And it states, how about discussions, General Barr, about the possible appointment of special counsel to invest the allegations of election fraud? Do you recall any of that? Answer, yes. I remember there were some discussions about special counsel, and I forgot how this came out, came up, but I didn't feel there was any predicate or basis for naming a special counsel, and I was opposed to it. And I think there was a proposal made. I remember a proposal being made to take a state attorney general being appointed, and I wanted to find out, you know, I thought there might be a way to addressing that without just saying no, and it turned out state law precluded it. Question, yeah, was that Louisiana, do you recall? Answer. I think it was Louisiana. I think it was Jeff Landry, maybe. Mr. Landry was President Trump's choice to be the special counsel to investigate allegations of election fraud. Mr. Sauer, and I, I apologize for not having pronounced your name properly before. Um, yes or no, 
Do you believe that the fraud impacted the outcome of the 2020 election? I'm sorry, you have to hit the... I'm sorry, I have no opinion on that. That is totally aside from the evidence that we brought so forth you, the committee today. at this time, you don't... You, um, you, that's no opinion? Do you don't have an opinion on whether there was fraud or not? I've never studied the evidence that but you're referring you were in, to. I've never seen the deposition transcript you just put I didn't before. ask about the deposition transcript. I asked you if you believe that there was election fraud in 2020. I don't have an opinion on that to okay, express thank the committee you. today. Mr. Seligman, same question. Did fraud impact the outcome of the 2020 election? No, without question. Was there any evidence of fraud? There was no evidence of fraud in any amount that was remotely close to what would it, it would have taken to affect the outcome of the election. So how did so many people come to believe that such fraud existed? Because they were told that by people who should have known better. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentlewoman's time has expired. It yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates. White House staffers are some of the most powerful people on the planet Earth. Oftentimes, they get the dispositive opinion on appointments to different positions within the federal government. They influence statements of administrative policy. They uh, initiate regulatory reform. They often have a significant voice on legislation that is considered and approved. And so, Mr. Sauer, I want to understand how many of these intensely powerful people who work in the Biden White House were involved in this effort that you've been investigating regarding the desire to shape discussions on social media? At least 20 and very likely more. And was there a ringleader of this group, someone who had pervasive and uh, repeated efforts to try to coerce social media companies to shape the truth according to the Biden White House? Deputy Assistant to the President Rob Flaherty and also Andy Slavitt. Who is Rob Flaherty? He is the, uh, I believe, the digital coordinator for the White House. His, his level is deputy assistant to the president. And what behaviors of Mr. Flaherty did you observe that you found troubling? We've seen many, many pages of emails between Mr. Flaherty and social media platforms where he relentlessly badgers them to increase the censorship of ordinary Americans' free speech on social media, and he gets results. You see the platforms agreeing to censor things that are truthful, that do not violate their policies at the behest and at the pressure of the White House. Can you give an example of that? One great example of this is the Tucker Carlson video that was going viral in April of 2021, where Mr. Flaherty and other White House officials were emailing Facebook privately, demanding that it be censored. Facebook responded, this does not violate our policies. It has not been fact-checked, but nevertheless, we are substantially de-boosting it and limiting its distribution on our platforms, even though we haven't identified anything false in it. And even though it does not, they had a positive determination that it does not violate their policies. And did you assess that Facebook took that action as a direct consequence of the badgering coming from Mr. Flaherty in the Biden White House? That is a compelling inference from the email traffic back and forth that we obtained in discovery. And, and did Mr. Flaherty ever request any reports from social media companies on specific censorship issues? Very frequently. In fact, he was demanding that again and again. His, his steady drumbeat was what he called borderline content, that the email traffic makes clear. Borderline is what they call often true content, things like personal anecdotes, uh, uh, opposition to vaccination expressed in terms of political opposition, things of that nature. That is what he wanted to target, and he was frequently asking for reports back. They were sending in bi-weekly crowd tangle reports to the White House. They did that through the close of our discovery period, last August in 2022. So uh, uh, there was, there was a, a, an overwhelming effort to get them to, to check their homework, if you will, to get them to report back on how much censorship are you doing and is it going to meet our standards as the White House? An overwhelming effort, badgering social media companies, demanding reports from those social media companies directly to someone in the White House. And as my colleagues on, on the other side of the aisle remind us, not all speech is protected. Some speech is illegal. Did you see Mr. Flaherty constrain his concern to unlawful speech, or did you often see this badgering and this demand for reports from entirely lawful speech? 
virtually ever, I can't remember a single instance of them going after unlawful speech. Almost all of it was after lawful speech? Virtually everything that I can recall here was a lawful First Amendment protected speech that was being targeted. Uh, we heard from the witness that the Democrats brought today that these were but suggestions, that of course the government should be able to make suggestions to social media companies. What would be your response to that testimony? The characterization of them as suggestions is contradicted by overwhelming evidence. Calling Flaherty, for example, Mr. Flaherty's communication suggestions is akin to saying that the earth is flat or the moon is made of green cheese. Well... And of course, if someone shared those viewpoints, that would be lawful speech, wouldn't it? You'd be allowed to say that on social media and based on the- Not US if Mr. Pre Flaherty were in charge. <laughs> That's, that is the difference. And in fact, what happened was you had a de facto suppression of many, many views, including truthful views, political organization at the behest of White House officials and other federal officials. And, and I would suggest, Mr. Chairman, that when you have these intensely powerful people with the ability to control so many things even a suggestion is coercive and problematic and worthy of the committee's review. I yield back. I thank the gentleman for his uh, five minutes. The gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Sanchez, recognized. Thank you. I think it's interesting, the last line of questioning. Um, the video that it's referenced, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that you just mentioned about Tucker Carlson was on replacement theory. Um, and I think it's interesting that you want to make a boogeyman of Mr. Flaherty um, because not one of the emails from Mr. Flaherty or anyone else from the White House required or demanded or mandated any action by social media companies. I just want to clear the record on that. Would the gentleman um, yield for just, no, just a the clarification? No, the time is mine. Okay. The time is mine. I would like to use it without interruption. Thank you. Um, you know, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle keep shouting that the Biden White House somehow influenced a private company to take down disinformation in 2020 before a Biden White House even existed. And Chairman Jordan wanted to make this point so badly that he had the two Republican attorneys general who began this sham lawsuit come in and make five minute statements where they could make all kinds of wild allegations and then he let them scurry away so nobody could ask them any questions about their claims. But I really want to focus on the, in on the fact that this hearing really isn't about social media companies, and it's really not about COVID deniers. It's not even about Elon Musk. It's about protecting former President Donald Trump. And I'd like to spend a few minutes looking at what congressional Republicans are doing to try to keep him out of legal trouble. We have a video queued up, if they could show that. Mr. Seligman, the general counsel to the Manhattan District Attorney called Chairman Jordan's letter an, quote, unprecedented inquiry into a pending local prosecution. The and, Trump hush money investigation. And, and said that it seeks non-public information about a pending criminal investigation, which is confidential under state law. Can you please explain why it's incredibly inappropriate for Congress to interfere in state and local prosecutions? Any political interference in pending criminal investigations and prosecutions is inappropriate. That's true of uh, political interference into the Department of Justice's prosecutorial decisions, and it's especially true of interference by the federal government into state and local prosecutions. The fundamental principles of federalism, which conservatives tend to agree with, um, hold that state and local government is free from the interference of the federal government into these police matters. Chairman Jordan apparently wrote to Mr. Bragg after Trump's attorneys asked him, and after Trump himself claimed online that he was about to be arrested. Why would it benefit Donald Trump for Congress to intervene on his behalf in this criminal action? Well, it appears that the purpose and the motivation is to try to influence the Manhattan District Attorney into not pursuing the charges that it has been publicly reported that he is pursuing. Why is even the appearance of a former president directing the action of members of Congress dangerous to democracy? Because the rule of law applies to all of us, whether we're a former president or a merely a lowly law professor. All of us are protected by the procedural protections of the Constitution, and all of us are subject to the law without fear or favor. Political interference into criminal prosecutions, whether that's interference to bring cases that would otherwise not be brought, or interference to protect politically powerful defendants from cases that ought to be brought undermines the rule of law and democracy. To me, Chairman Jordan's demand appear to be an intimidation tactic, plain and simple, and he's using this very committee to carry out that intimidation. 
isn't that, in fact, the very definition of weaponization of the government? I see why you say that, and it is inappropriate for a congressional committee to inquire into a pending criminal investigation. I thank you for your testimony, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stubbe, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Sauer, earlier this week, I questioned HHS Secretary Becker, um before the Ways and Means Committee, and I asked him about a report put out by a private research organization called Cochrane that found masks may not be effective in preventing COVID. That same organization did an about face a few weeks later. Like on January, they issued the report finding there was no scientific evidence or proof that masks worked. And then on March 10th, they issued a report that basically said, well, what we said before was not fully accurate. Um, Secretary Bukira claimed that he had no knowledge of HHS or anyone in the administration pressuring Cochrane to withdraw their findings. And I specifically asked him that. He was under oath. I specifically asked him if he knew if anybody in HHS had information as it related to that. From your experience, has HHS pressured private organizations to take certain stances and censor information regarding COVID? Yes, our evidence includes pretty extensive emails involving senior HHS officials, including within the office of the secretary, involved in these kinds of pressure campaigns to engage in censorship. We also have extensive evidence of sub-agencies within HHS, which is described in some detail in my written testimony, including NIAID, NIH, and the CDC. Well, in the Biden administration, in, in these emails, um, much to the chagrin of my colleagues on the other side who say there's no evidence that Mr. Flattery um, was working with Facebook. I mean, these emails that you put are actually part of your uh, statement today. Is that correct? That is correct. And, and I mean, you have conversations here about content. You have conversations here about vaccines. You have Facebook sharing uh, attachments and research with Mr. Flattery. You have Mr. Flattery uh, telling them, I think, like actually telling them what Facebook should be doing. And I'll just read a quick expert and again, excerpt. And again, this is in the materials that you provided to the committee. Uh, generally, I think some combo of the following would be effective. Some kind of thing that puts the news in context if folks have seen it, like COVID news panel. I mean, he's directing Facebook of how they should promulgate information, uh, which I would say is disinformation, but their opinion on certain information. Uh, and there's, it's right there in your, in your testimony that you've given here today. Can you just like expand on that a little bit? Sure, thank you for the question, Representative. We see email after email after email from the White House, from Mr. Flaherty, pressuring specifically Facebook, but also other social media platforms to take down disfavored viewpoints. And the emphasis in those emails is on true content. The reason that the emphasis on true content is because he almost says this in so many words in one of the emails that the true content is what they perceive to be doing the most to undermine the narrative that the White House favored at the time. So it's viewpoint discrimination targeting truthful speech that they perceive to be the most damaging to the narrative that they're pushing. Which you have actual emails from the White House as part of your testimony today. We have submitted uh, those, yes. And I, I would just... It's already in the record, but I just want to bring people's attention to that. Um, as it relates to that, the Surgeon General also pressured big tech companies to only allow on their platforms administration approved information about COVID. Could you go into a little detail about that? That's exactly correct. What we see is what's probably an orchestrated pressure campaign involving the Surgeon General and the Surgeon General's office and what their witness described in sworn testimony as their bully pulpit to engage in this a pressure campaign that reinforced the pressure campaign that was ha happening largely covertly from the White House, but also at key points became very public. For example, May 5th, 2021, July 15th and 16th, 2021, you have very public pressure from the White House. Then behind the scenes, you have emails where the Office of Surgeon General and the White House are, in a sense, teaming up with the social media platforms to pressure them to remove the, the, the information that they thought was uh, uh, unworthy of First Amendment protections. And I've only got a little less than a minute, but could you use the remainder of your time to talk about the more inappropriate ways that the administration sought to control inf information related to COVID and vaccines? 
Uh, yes, there's a whole series of these that are set forth in my written testimony. You have the pressure campaign from the White House that involved both public and private components. That was executed in, as I said, kind of in tandem with a similar pressure campaign from the Surgeon General's office. But also you see both uh, extensive evidence of federally induced censorship out of NIAID under the, le the leadership of Dr. Fauci, and also the CDC, who we haven't mentioned today. You see the CDC both having meeting after meeting after meeting and flagging uh, uh, specific content, individual posts in large numbers saying, be on the lookout for this. This is what we, the CDC, want you to censor. And you see the platforms responding by kind of deferring to the CDC and allowing the CDC to dictate what Americans can and cannot say on social media. My time's expired. Thank you for being here today, and I look forward to working with you. Thank the gentleman. Gentlemen, yield back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Garamendi from California for five minutes of questioning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I before we broke for votes, the issue from one of my colleagues came up about comparing the administration with the German Stasis. Uh, Mr. Siegelman, I'd like you to talk about this inappropriate comparison. It is an inappropriate and inaccurate comparison. Uh, the allegations in the lawsuit brought by Mr. Landry and others is that the federal government coerced social media platforms into censoring content. And there's been vague talk about pressure campaigns and emails uh, between White House officials and social media campaigns. But in federal court, you have to make allegations about what exactly the threats were. And so from the record of the case, uh, here is the Cyber, cyber uh, Security Infrastructure and Security Agency, the emails that are cited um, by Mr. Landry's lawsuit as threats. Uh, CISA will not take any action, favorable or unfavorable, towards social media companies based on decisions about how or whether to use this information. CISA neither has nor seeks the ability to remove or edit what information is made available on social media platforms. In light of this absence of a threat in the communications between government officials and social media platforms, the lawsuit turns to other allegations of threatened action. It turns to two. The first is antitrust action against big, big tech companies, and the second is reform of Section 230. Now, these are implausible bases for threats by the Biden administration against big tech companies. And the reason is because there's a growing bipartisan consensus that big, big tech companies should be subject to more antitrust enforcement. For example, on uh, May 19, 2022, uh, Congressman Gates was among a group of uh, four bipartisan Congress members who introduced legislation that, quote, takes direct aim at Google and Facebook's ad market duopoly. Um, and so Congressman Gates introduced legislation that targeted Facebook and Google for antitrust scrutiny. I don't think that that makes him threatening in violation of the First Amendment, Google and Facebook, um, such that their decisions on content moderation are suddenly the responsibility of Congressman Gates. Similarly, on June 11th of 2021, Chairman Jordan introduced the Protect Speech Act, which would have reformed Section 230 to limit or eliminate the, the immunity that social media platforms have for civil liability for content posted on their platforms. This too, this too was a, uh, a legislative proposal that is exactly the same type of uh, legislative proposal that this lawsuit and Republicans on this panel are suggesting constitutes a threat. I don't think that Chairman Jordan's introduction of legislation constitutes a threat in violation of the First Amendment. And so once we move past the vague allegations of threatening emails and look to what the lawsuit actually alleges, we see there were no threats and the challenge course of action was just legislative proposals that have been made both by Republicans and by Democrats. Thank you very much. It's useful to note the actions of the members of this committee uh, in that regard. Thank you very much. Uh, as we look at the, what is going on here, uh, our friends across the aisle here continue to claim that there's censorship. Uh, last hearing, I provided uh, extensive uh, information and multiple studies that showed that the social media actually amplifies far right voices more than uh, left voices, uh, including their false claims about election interference and their efforts to spread COVID disinformation. So if uh, there really is a problem here, it obviously isn't working. 
the select committee on the sub on the uh, weaponization of government is really missing the major weapon that was used by the previous administration. President Trump used the federal government, used his position as president and his office of the presidency and others in the administration to promote the big lie that the election was stolen. There is no doubt the January 6th committee proved this beyond a doubt that that's exactly what happens. That is the example of weaponization that this committee should be paying attention to and should be looking for legislation that that kind of weaponization by the President of the United States to stop the lawful transfer of power in an election in which there was no proven fraud, that that is where we should be spending our time. My time having expired, I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Bishop, recognized for five minutes. Yield to Mr. Gates. I'm shocked I have to explain to a law professor that there's an obvious difference between engaging in the legislative process that is open and transparent and subject to our constitutional system rather than having some skeevy White House staffers trying to threaten social media companies uh, under the auspices of some sort of, of allowed content moderation. I yield back to the gentleman from North Carolina. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Sauer, uh, Mr. Seligman, Seligman's testimony asserts that the federal government didn't threaten or coerce the social media platform. Says, says the, the uh, Attorney General's complaint that you're litigating in federal court lacks a reasonable legal and factual basis. They didn't mention, as I understand it, just last week, the United States District Judge in that case denied the administration's motions to dismiss. Doesn't that denial mean the opposite of what Mr. Selig Seligman testified? Get, turn on your mic. Is your mic on? Our federal district judge came to the opposite conclusion. Yeah. So, I mean, that conclusion is that the complaint plausibly alleges, but it gives plausible factual allegations in support of a legally sufficient legal theory that this censorship scheme, in fact, violates the First Amendment. Um, can you summarize some of the uh, allegations of fact concerning coercion and threats that you tendered to the court to, rent, to lead to that conclusion? Yes, and I, I preface that by saying, in fact, there's more than one way you can violate the First Amendment. There's coercion, there's joint participation, there's conspiracy, there is deception, there is pervasive entwinement, and there is significant encouragement. So even if we hadn't alleged threats, it would in no way undermine our claim that there's a First Amendment violation, but there's overwhelming evidence of threats. Uh, and if, if I may, I can summarize some of those. So, Give you a little bit of time on that, yeah. Uh, obviously, one of the things we've alleged is that the threats about antitrust liability and Section 230 repeal or replacement, those on one side are tied to demands for greater censorship. It's one thing for a federal official to say, we should repeal or replace uh, Section 230 immunity, it's quite otherwise for them to say, you'd better censor private American speech on social media or we will take that action against you. Right. It's the threat linked to the demand, which is what violates the First Amendment. And the case law is abundantly clear on this, and the evidence of that is overwhelming. But that's not all. We have all kinds of other threats. For example, in the Elvis Chan deposition, it was revealed that Congressional staffers had been flying out to Silicon Valley to privately meet with the social media platforms since 2017, bringing proposed legislation with them to threaten them with adverse legal counsels if censorship didn't improve. And what Mr. Chan, the government's FBI agent, testified is that this was effective. How they experienced the pressure. It made a huge difference. It censored. How many FBI agents did Twitter say interacted with Twitter? Uh, 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 I can't remember off the top of my Numbers head. Numbers in the 80s, isn't it? 80-something? Uh, uh, Certainly the Fed Foreign Influence Task Force includes about 78 to 80 agents, I believe. And then there's another eight in, uh, in San Francisco office alone that are involved in these activities. So I, many. I, I know your written testimony contains hundreds of pages of these allegations. So it's interesting. Mr. Seligman, uh, you, uh, you referred to yourself as a professor. Now, you're a fellow at the Constitutional Law Center at Stanford Law School. Isn't that right? That is correct. And, and you're not on the faculty at Stanford Law School. That's right. And I didn't claim otherwise. Okay. Um, it, you graduated from law school in 2011. Your LinkedIn uh, resume suggests you've, you haven't had any job longer than about three and a half years since then. As I, I looked on Lexis. I couldn't find any case in which you've served as counsel of record in which you finally prevailed. Can you name one? Uh, I've worked on legal teams that have prevailed at every level of the federal judiciary, including the Supreme Court. Can you name a case? States. 
Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, Tyson v. Buafakio, which is a case at the Supreme Court. Tyson versus what? Uh, Buafakio was a case. Uh, it was a case about Rule uh, 23 class certification. Okay. We prevailed. Okay. What reason is it? So you're not a professor. You're not, I don't, do you claim expertise in the First Amendment? Do you claim to be a First Amendment expert? I am an expert in constitutional law, including the First Amendment. Yes. Interestingly enough, on, on your uh, website, on the Stanford website, it says you're an expert in election law, but you're, we have, you also have broad uh, research interest in constitutional law. It doesn't even mention the First Amendment. Uh, as many legal scholars do, I have a diverse set of interests. Mr. Sauer, uh, wouldn't it be squarely in conflict with the First Amendment to censor Mr. Seligman's opinion just because it conflicts with the official narrative as represented by the district court judge's opinion? Absolutely. The First Amendment protects everybody. Um, can you take in the last few seconds I've got and talk briefly about how the Election Integrity Project and the Virality Project have moved to censoring whole narratives? Yes, there is. Uh, uh, I see that time is almost up, but there is, a, there is a concerted effort that we see in the evidence to censor narrative at a narrative level, where a narrative can contain hundreds of thousands of social media posts, and that is operated out of Stanford University. Thank you, time's expired. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Allred, to recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Sauer, when you came to the Capitol today, uh, did you go through security? Yes or no? Yes. Did you interact with the Capitol Police at all when you did that? Uh, I may have said hello to one of them. Well, just over two years ago, one of the police officers you saw might have been one of the nearly 150 officers who were injured when the Capitol was attacked by a violent mob, or one of the hundreds more that are still dealing with mental trauma from that day. That attack was organized, in some cases orchestrated, on social media. Those officers' lives were put at risk and seven people died in connection with the attack on January 6th. And are you familiar with the Internet uh, Record Agency located in St. Petersburg, Russia? Yes or no? Uh, there is some evidence relating to it are in you, our are case. Are you familiar with it? So uh, I would say that a level of familiarity uh, at some level, but limited. Sure. Well, it's a Kremlin asset that uses fake accounts, bots, and hacked materials to influence elections here in the United States in 2016, 2020, again in 2022. Uh, that's not my opinion. It was at the center of a 2018 DOJ criminal indictment for its efforts to interfere with elections and our political processes. Do you know who was president of the United States in 2018? President Trump. President Trump was in office. I note the attack on January 6th and the Russian misinformation efforts to point out that our social media is being used to incite violence and by foreign actors who do want to undermine our democracy. And despite that, as you noted in your testimony, Mr. Seligman, the agencies responsible for our national security are not requiring uh, that content be taken down. They have flagged it. And the decision has rested with those private companies. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. And maybe the most, one of the most egregious examples that's come out in the series of congressional hearings we've held about this uh, from a White House official uh, contacting a social media agency, uh, a social media company, was the Trump White House reaching out about a Chrissy Teigen tweet and saying that it should be taken down because it said mean things about the president. Can you, can you imagine that? Do you think that was a violation of the First Amendment, Mr. Sauer? We haven't seen that tweet in our case. I'm not familiar with it, but I would emphasize that for you're any federal elected official, for any familiar? federal elected official to demand that content be taken down raises serious First Amendment concerns. Good. Well, then, okay, so you, you're saying that when the Trump White House did that, uh, you, you, that raises concerns for you. I would say if any federal official, elected or unelected, is communicating with social media platforms and demanding that content be taken down, that raises grave First Amendment concerns. And we put in evidence of that occurring on Listen, the scale of hundreds, hundreds of millions the, the of issue social here, media posts. You know, the issue here is that much of the, some of the discussions that we're talking about here occurred when Trump was in office. There's a claim of some vast conspiracy led by the Biden administration, much of it centering on activity by the FBI around the last election when Donald Trump was in office. Well, the Trump, I'm not asking a question yet. But the Trump White House itself was reaching out to social media companies, trying to suppress you know, certain discussions. And 
the truth is that despite all the claims being made here today, that social media is being used uh, to censor conservatives, it, so the truth is that their platforms have repeatedly failed to prevent their own platforms from being used to incite violence, to spread disinforma disinformation, and said Twitter actually changed its own policies to allow Donald Trump to repeatedly spread lies about the election. And we have some examples that I'd like to put up here really quickly. All the way back in May of 2020, six months before the election, President Trump was tweeting that it, this would be a rigged election, that there would be massive fraud and abuse, that 2020 would be the most rigged election in our nation's history. That content was not taken down. It was allowed to stay up. That doesn't sound like censorship to me. Those decisions were made by private companies during Donald Trump's presidency. Mr. Stigman, I don't have a lot of time left, but I just wanted to ask you, as an expert, in a democracy, what does it do when statements like this from a head of state are allowed to attack it, their, the very democracy they're supposed to be leading? I think it inflames people's political passions. And you know, when hundreds of millions of people see claims like that and believe them and believe that our elections are not free and fair, contrary to fact, some of them ultimately take extreme action in response to that. And that is the danger of misinformation. But it was still allowed to stay up. Gentlemen's time's expired. Not, there's no grand conspiracy. Take off the tin foil hats. Gentlemen's time's expired. Understand what's really going on. Gentlemen from Kentucky, Kentucky Mr. Massey is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Seligman, are you familiar with the lawsuit against President Trump where he blocked people on Twitter? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> on July 16, 2021, a reporter asked President Biden what his message was to social media platforms when it came to COVID-19 disinformation. He replied, quote, they're killing people, end quote. I know a, one of our missing witnesses uh, referenced that quote earlier, but I can't ask him about those questions because he's been excused. Now, if you look at the chart behind me, this represents the consequences of vaccine science denialism. The arrow points to May 2021, when the vaccine became widely available in the United States. The deaths to the right of the arrow represent the continued wrath of COVID on our country, mostly among unvaccinated people in Texas and the southern U.S. And as you can see, 200,000 lives could have been saved. That's how many people were killed. Now, if we use the same formula, uh, that means that 15,000 lives could have been saved in Chairman uh, uh, Jordan's state of Ohio, or 5,000 lives could have been saved in Chairman Johnson's state of Louisiana. That's a lot of people. Many communities across the United States have been utterly devastated by COVID. Y'all know I represent parts of Houston, a big city, but I was born and raised in a small Texas rural community. In Duval County, where I was born, one out of 151 people died of COVID. In a similar community like Lamb County, Texas, nearly one out of every 100 people was killed by COVID. This death rate was one of the highest in the country and three times that of the nation of a whole. In fact, across the country, rural America's death rate has been nearly 40% higher than that of those in cities. This is tragically sad, and I believe it's vaccine denialism that caused these American deaths. Only 56% of rural residents are fully vaccinated versus 67% of their urban counterparts. In my home state of Texas, it's estimated that 2,000 lives could have been saved if we had reached the vaccination levels of places like Vermont or Connecticut. Mr. Sauer, you signed the Missouri v. Biden's plaintiff's motion for preliminary injunction. That motion claims that Biden's statement that the social media companies are, quote, killing people by letting vaccine disinformation spread was somehow illegal censorship. I frankly cannot disagree with you more strongly. But I have a simple fact question for you today. Mr. Sauer, for you, do you agree that COVID vaccine saves lives? Just a yes or no, please. Mr. Sauer, I ask for a yes or no. Yes, two simple words, yes or no. So you're Harvard trained, you, you pretend to be an expert here and you cannot answer the simple question of whether or not you agree that COVID vaccine saves lives. Put, gentlemen, 
Mr. Sauer, can you put Mr. Hit, Sidlin, can you hit the microphone? Will you there? answer my question since it looks like our Harvard colleague over there cannot? Yes, I believe vaccines save lives. Thank you. Mr. Sauer, you also signed the Missouri versus Biden Second Amendment complaint, which criticized Twitter for removing content suggesting that, quote, face masks do not work to reduce transmission or to protect against COVID-19. Well, as a journalist in Texas uh, did a lot of the work that apparently you haven't and compiled 49 studies all showing that masks effectively reduce the rate of COVID transmission. Mr. Sauer, yes or no again. Do you agree that face masks stop the transmission of COVID? I refer you to the... Uh, the sir, the, a yes or no question. Uh, again, Congresswoman, you, I yes refer you... Yes or no question, sir. I refer you... It is my time. I want a yes or no. If that's too hard for you, then I'll just move on. So I'll ask you, Mr. Zygnerman, do you agree that face masks stop the transmission of COVID? My understanding is the scientific evidence is yes, it does. Right, so Mr. Sauer, your motion for preliminary injunction claims that even U.S. Department of Health and Human Services efforts to gather information about how widespread COVID-19 disinformation could somehow be censorship. Knowing how the American people are being lied to is not censorship, but I guess you might be scared what the data will show. Mr. Sauer, again, a yes or no, do you believe that public health experts need data about the impact of disinformation in order to stop people in places like rural Texas from dying from this pandemic? Federal officials should not be demanding data about Ms. people's Sir, political and social opinions yes no? expressed on social media. Yes or media. no, please. I, I, I reiterate what Do I say. Not, under the First Amendment. You're refusing to answer my question. Under the First Amendment, you're federal officials should not be demanding Mr. that. Mr. Sigelman, do you agree that data on disinformation is necessary to help stop these lies from spreading? Yes. Thank you. You're an actual expert on disinformation. Ladies, so time has expired. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Chair, I recognize the gentleman from North Dakota, Mr. Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Seligman, your testimony describes that state action case law, and I'll, I'll try and boil it down to in si its simplest terms, that it comes down to the distinction between convince and coerce. And you state that because there was no overt threats to the platforms that the government is in the clear. And I want to be clear, I reject that premise and agree significantly more with Mr. Sauer. But for the sake of argument, let's consider that each individual instance only constitutes attempts to convince, to convince platforms by the administration. We still have to view this in, this, in, in its totality. There was an unprecedented level of continuous engagement between the administration and social media companies to address not only categories of speech, but specific individuals, specific content, and specific view viewpoints. The sheer quantity has a quality all of its own. The administration performed this unprecedented level of continuous engagement at several levels. The FBI, the CDC, Department of Homeland Security, essentially every single alphabet soup agency, the White House, and that's not even taking into account the State, De Par the State Department funding a nonprofit whose goal was to censor such radical, radical media as the Federalist, Reason, and the New York Post. In one instance, the White House staffer Rob Flaherty sent this exact message to Google. This is a concern that is shared at the highest level, and I mean the highest levels of the White House. He's talking about the President of the United States, and this is coming from an administration that has supported and advanced several policies directly targeting the business models of social media companies, antitrust enforcement, Section 230, encryption, and the list goes on and on. And regardless of which government agency is pressuring these social media companies, on any particular issue, they were all being received by the same content moderation teams at those social media companies. The administration isn't going to say, do this or we will shut you down. To be quite honest, that's not how government coercion is carried out. They are never going to directly, directly threaten anyone. But the message is clear from a continuous request, play ball or else. The end result is harming Americans' First Amendment right to speak and also to receive information. Understanding that content, Mr. Seligman, understanding that content-based restrictions are, con are, are unconstitutional, are you not at all concerned that the administration's continuous actions have chilled Americans' free speech rights? I don't think that the administration's actions constitute a First Amendment violation, as you noted. Uh, I don't think there were any overt threats, and I don't think there were any covert threats as well. And the best indication that we have of that is that social media platforms could and did 
disagree with the suggestions that were offered by governmental officials, and they made decisions that conflicted with those recommendations without consequence, repeatedly. Well, they, without consequences, they got a lot of emails back and forth. Mr. Sauer, um, we all understand that if, if federal law enforcement wants to search your, the trunk of your car, you need a warrant. And the federal government can't get around that warrant by using a capital security guard to open that trunk and then look what's in it. And one of the biggest things that we've been continuing to talk about in, in, this, in this context is the third party doctrine. If the DOJ can't search my car without a warrant, they can't use a security guard to search my car. But the, this administration, even though they can't directly censor First Amendment viewpoint discrimination, is trying to use social media companies to carry out their task. How do you view that moving forward? That is a grave threat to liberty. It directly undermines the First Amendment, and your statements are supported by overwhelming evidence in the record. And the answer about the third party doctrine, which we have carried out in different things and we're dealing with it now, just is simply new and we continue to move forward. What recommendation would you have for us as Congress to start dealing with this issue? I believe that this subcommittee should take a very close look and scrutinize the various forms of First Amendment violations we see in this case. Again, not just coercion, but also joint participation and significant entwinement. For example, when you have federal and state officials working hand in glove with nonprofits like the Stanford Internet Observatory, which are also tightly connected to social media platforms to engage in mass surveillance, to engage in the censorship of, we're talking about millions and millions of social media posts systemic First Amendment violations, that needs to be carefully scrutinized. And then just with the little time I have left, I know it came up earlier with objectionable. As long, provided that speech is lawful, content-based discrimination by the U.S. government is a First Amendment violation. Correct? Correct. So the fact that that speech is objectionable, again, provided that it's constitutionally protected, it's irrelevant to when you're dealing with government discrimination. That's exactly right. Under the First Amendment, government officials don't get to decide what is objectionable or what is true and false. We get to decide that. And it absolutely has to be that way. Otherwise, who polices the policers? Absolutely right. This is the heart of the First Amendment. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Mr. Uh, Chairman. The gentleman yields back. We now Mr. Chairman, I ask for unanimous consent to enter three, uh, four documents into the record. Got it. Without objection, can you Thank identify you. the documents first, though? Can you identify the documents? Sure. Uh, the uh, first is a t Time Magazine article titled, Is This Texas County? There's No Such Thing as Moving on, on from COVID, from KXAN News in Austin. Do face masks work? Here are 49 scientific studies that explain that they do. From the Washington Post, an article titled, The Insight Story of How Trump's Denial, Mismanagement, and Magical Thinking led to the pandemic's dark winter. And finally, a report published in PLOS Global Public Health by Peter Hotez, Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine and Professor of Departments of Pediatrics and Molecular Virology and Microbiology at Baylor College of Medicine and the endowed chair in Tropical Pediatrics and co-director for vaccine development at Texas Children's Hospital titled, The Great Texas COVID Tragedy Be Entered into the Record. Objection. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from New York is recognized for five minutes question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Sauer, did you discuss the substance of your testimony here today with any members of this committee? Yes. I can, can you turn your microphone on? I participated in a briefing uh, yesterday afternoon with members of the subcommittee when my testimony had already been finalized. And uh, were any Democratic members included in that briefing? Uh, I can't say for sure. I don't know all the members who were involved. You don't know? I, just, I don't know. I, I'm, not, I, I'm not as familiar with the membership of the committee as perhaps I should be. And am I correct that, uh, I'll just note for the record, there were no Democratic members in that briefing. Um, but am I correct, sir, that you are one of the lawyers that brought the lawsuit that we are discussing here today? That is correct. So you're a party to that case? No, I'm an attorney. That's very different. Well, you represent Louisiana. You work for the De Attorney General's Office of Louisiana, and the Louisiana brought the case? That's correct. It would be inaccurate to s describe me as a party. Okay. Um, and, but you don't decide whether or not your arguments that you make in that case and that you're making here today are valid or not, do you? Uh, they seem very valid to me. The judge you, will make a decision in our case. The and judge makes the decision, right? Correct. Not you. 
And as you know, the district court did not decide in its opinion whether your assertions are correct, right? The district court dismissed the pending motion to dismiss by the Department of Justice, saying that we'd allege sufficient facts to state claims, and we'll have a hearing in late May on our pending motion for preliminary injunction. He has right. not ruled so, on that so yet. So just so lay people can understand, a motion to dismiss just says that if the allegations that you make are true, you can continue with your claim. A preliminary injunction will actually address the evidence that you're discussing, right? That's correct. Okay. Now, I... Are you expecting uh, that the Department of Justice will appeal the motion to dismiss order? You would have to ask them. Well, actually, the motion to dismiss order, it's very unlikely because there is no procedural right to appeal that. And so far, they haven't made any attempt to do that. It would be an ex They would have to do that by pursuing what's called an extraordinary writ. That'd right. be very unusual. That said, I do not speak for them. Do you read the news, sir? I'm sorry? Do you read the news? Uh, some news. Are you aware of reporting that Donald Trump's defense attorney asked Republican members of the House of Representatives to intervene in an ongoing criminal investigation into himself in a local prosecutor's office? I don't recall reading that. Okay. If that were the case, would you consider that to be called, quote, directing, unquote, that the House of Representatives act on behalf of Donald Trump? I would have to know much, many more facts before I'm able to make any kind of judgment like that. Right. All right. Well, I just want to understand, because you talk a lot about directing here, that the government is directing, uh, but then you also say that there's a compelling inference. Now, we lawyers understand that inferences only occur when you don't have direct evidence to support it, so I would also just want to note that. We have overwhelming you know, the sad, direct evidence. There's no question. Um, the sad reality here is that we are continuing to go down this phantom narrative that the White House or the Biden administration coerced social media companies into censoring anti-vaccine and election disinformation and misinformation. Now, we know why that is, because the members on the other side of the aisle believe that that disinformation and misinformation, if it gets out there, is politically beneficial to them. But unfortunately, Neither you nor they have presented any direct evidence to support this. But I would actually submit that this hearing is more notable, not because of the topic and the witnesses, including two who were too afraid to stay and answer questions, but because of what we are not focusing on. Apparently, this committee is no longer focused on the so-called dozens and dozens of FBI whistleblowers who were supposedly going to show some massive government conspiracy to attack conservatives. Three of them have now come in for transcribed interviews over a month ago. Where are those witnesses, Mr. Chairman? Let's bring them in. Bring them in right here so that the American people can see for themselves what the entire basis of this subcommittee is. Now, you want to talk about censorship? You imagined in your opening statement a world where the FBI sends a list of books that should be pulled from their shelves. Luckily, we don't have to imagine that, sir. Are you aware that recent laws in Florida have resulted in the mass removal of books that are now banned in public schools? I don't know about Florida. I do know that we have sworn testimony from FBI agent Elvis Chan that directly backs up the analogy I drew in my opening statement. Okay, well, just you should go look into this. Expired. You should go look into it because Florida right now is banning books, and you would agree that's a violation of the First Amendment. Gentlemen's you, time's expired. Gentlemen's time's expired. Can, can and, the and witness since, answer the question? Would no, because you, you were over your time. And because you addressed the chair, I'll tell you, stay tuned, Mr. Goldman. There's much more to come in this committee. The gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Kamick, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for appearing before us here today. I've heard your last name pronounced a couple of different ways today. How, do, how is it properly pronounced? Seligman, thank you very much. Seligman? Seligman. Okay, yes. thank you, Mr. Seligman. You stated you are an expert in constitutional law, correct? Yes. Okay, excellent. In your testimony, your written testimony, which was provided to us late last night, uh, it says that, quote, and this is your writing, no government official ever threatened any social media platform with adverse action if a platform declined to moderate content flagged by the official or if a platform decided not to take an official's suggestions. Do you stand by your testimony? Yes. Okay. Now, a few minutes ago, just prior, you said that members of the legislative branch don't qualify for this particular statement, despite the fact that you said no government official ever. 
Does a representative in Congress constitute a government official? Well, let me clarify uh, my do. testimony uh, from earlier. I don't think that legislative proposals that were brought by Republicans or Democrats constitute uh, threats against social media platforms. Uh, that's true but, whether with respect to Section 230 reform. It's sure. true with respect to antitrust enforcement. So that would then lead us to the natural inclination to believe that you're talking about the executive branch, correct? Uh, uh, being government officials. So government officials like the deputy assistant to the president and director of digital strategy like Robert Flattery or the White House senior advisor like Andrew Slavitt or the NSC staffer Katie Colas or the deputy assistant to the president or the White House digital director or the press secretary for the first lady or the NSC director for counterterrorism, the chief of staff for the Office of Digital Strategy, the director of strategic communication and engagement, the White House associate counsel, associate director for communications, the deputy director of digital strategy, and the strategic director of digital communications. Those are government officials, correct? Yes. yes. Okay. And what's so interesting is that all of these members of the executive branch, all of them, have communications, thousands of emails between them and Twitter and Meta officials where they demand that posts be taken down and censored. I'll give you a couple of, of examples and then we'll see if you, you still feel so strongly about your words. January 23rd, three days after the inauguration, at 1.04 a.m., Clark Humphrey of the White House emails Twitter and says, we're flagging this post for you. Hey folks, wanted to flag this tweet, wondering if we can get moving on the process to have it taken down, dot, 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 ASAP. Then, on February 7th, an email exchange took place between Twitter and White House Deputy Assistant to the President and Director of Digital Strategy, Rob Flattery, and asked for the steps that he could take to, quote, streamline the process for the White House's demands for Twitter censorship. Then two days later, on February 9th, 2021, he follows up again with Facebook with a more aggressive demand for more information, along with an accusation that would be repeated many times in the future, that Facebook was failing to censor speech, uh, to censor speech on its platform and it was causing, quote, political violence. Fast forward, you have March 15th, White House senior advisor then made an om om ominous statement threatening unspecified executive action against Facebook in retaliation for Facebook's perceived lack of cooperation with the White House's list of demands that have been documented and will be inserted into the record for this hearing on censorship of, quote, borderline content. The line that I think is particularly troubling is saying, Internally, we have been considering our options on what to do about it. Do you consider that to be non-threatening? I'm not familiar with the particular documents that you're referring to. I just um, read you multiple examples. Yes, and so I don't think that emphatic expressions of the concern, their concerns about the problem of misinformation is a threat. I don't. So when President Biden says that social media companies are killing people and then there is a direct line from the White House to the social media companies demanding posts be removed, going so far as to say there has to be a quick and devastating takedown, a published takedown, that is not a threat? I don't believe so. Wow. I also don't believe it wow. was a threat when President I, Trump I am, made comments about uh, social media. I am so glad we well. have this on the record. Um, again, my apologies to you, sir, for what you've had to endure here today. But with that, I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady's time's expired. Uh, chair recognizes Ms. Hageman from Wyoming for five minutes. Thank you, um, Mr. Sauer. Uh, you and, and your colleagues have truly provided a great service to this nation by exposing what we can rightfully describe as the surveillance industrial complex, the censorship industrial complex, the corruption industrial complex. Take your pick. Your testimony today is stunning, as is your written statement, and I encourage everyone to read the information that you have provided. Um, the breadth and scope of this vast censorship complex is stunning and extends from the halls of Congress to the executive branch to the office of the President of the United States. As the last, one of the last questioners today, I want to give you the opportunity to speak directly to the American public. And I'd like you to give us examples of just one or two takeaways that you believe are paramount 
as we continue our work and as we seek to hold this administration and these uh, corrupt government hacks accountable for their blatant violation of the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. I would emphasize maybe two or three points. First, federal censorship activities are not in retreat. They are expanding. Federal executive officials are expanding the topics on which they seek censorship. It's expanding to more and more agencies, and it's expanding to any social media platform they can reach to. So we are not in a situation where this is something that occurred in the past. We have overwhelming evidence that it's growing and growing and growing, and there's little indication that there will ever be any voluntary relinquishment of the power to dictate what ordinary Americans can say on social media. So it's a problem that is growing. It's a looming threat. A second point that I would make is that censorship, as I said in my opening statement, both now and every other time when there's been censorship throughout human history is not about truth. It is about political power. It's about obtaining power. It's about preserving power. And it's about expanding power. And the evidence of this, again, is overwhelming. You see it right there in the documents, some of which were just quoted. You see the White House saying, what we really want you to take down, Facebook, Twitter, and so forth, is borderline content. Borderline content that's described in the emails is often true. It's often true. It involves core political speech. We want you to take that down because that is what is most effectively undermining the narratives that we want to be out there on social media. That's an egregious violation of the First Amendment. It is viewpoint discrimination. I would also point out that Many of the comments that have been made on the other side today have said we can't let there be misinformation on social media because a tiny minority of the 100 million people who might see it might take it and do something bad. You might call that the minority report approach to the First Amendment. It's absolute poppycock. It turns the First Amendment absolutely on its head. The, the, the promise of the First Amendment is that no official high or petty will be able to dictate what Americans do. Americans can make their own opinions. They are adults. They can read the evidence. They can form their own factual opinions and their own, and their own opinions. And, and that is the core and the heartland of the First Amendment, which we see radically perverted, radically perverted in the communications between the White House and virtually every other federal agency that's discussed in my extensive written testimony. I would also emphasize Censorship does not make Americans safer. It does not make them healthier. And it does not protect our democracy. Censorship is what kills, not freedom. Freedom is what preserves our liberty. Freedom is what makes us safe and healthy as a society. So this notion that we've got to have censorship because it's going to be a threat to our democracy. What could be more anti-democratic than federal censorship dictating what ordinary Americans can say on social media? The First Amendment and social media radically democratize speech. The First Amendment is the most pro-democratic political statement in history, perhaps, because what it says is every ordinary citizen can decide for themselves without interference from federal officials as to what, is, what their opinion is. And we can participate in a free market ideas with freedom of expression, freedom of association to engage in that. And that's what we see under direct assault by a whole army of federal officials in this case. And finally, I would emphasize that this should not be a partisan issue. Censorship violates the First Amendment no matter what viewpoint federal officials are going after. Everyone, everyone in this chamber should oppose the sorts of pressure, collusion, uh, uh, deception, all the things you see in our evidence in this case. Federal officials should not be in the business of saying what Americans can and cannot say on social media. And those are the conclusions that I would offer the American people. Well, and again, thank you for, for what you have just described. Uh, what an incredible summary and a statement of where we are in this country. We appreciate what you've done, what you've been willing to expose. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady has expired. I'll yield to myself uh, five minutes uh, as we wrap this up today. Uh, we've heard a lot. Mr. Sauer, what you just said was extraordinary, and I wish every American could watch that, that clip because you summarized it so well. I thank the gentlelady for giving you the opportunity. What you said earlier this morning uh, summarizes it well also. You said censorship impedes the pursuit of truth in the free marketplace of ideas. That's the summary. Look, we brought in exceptional witnesses this morning. We brought in the Attorney General of the state of Louisiana and the former Attorney General of Missouri, now a U.S. Senator, because their litigation has revealed 
overwhelming direct evidence, as you've pointed out, that the executive branch has undertaken a broad campaign to censor the American people. That's the headline. That's the takeaway today. Rather than one-off instances of censorship and coordination between federal agencies and the private sector, your case has revealed how federal agencies and officials have taken a whole-of-government approach to censoring online speech about topics that they think are disfavored. The federal government exchanged in two blatantly unconstitutional acts. First, uh, they, uh, they, they, they coerced technology companies to engage in censorship. They did this in a number of ways, and at least 20 officials in the White House itself were involved. Then the federal government colluded with the big tech companies and others to censor content. We know that federal agencies met frequently with social media companies and received internal platform data and other special privileges that empowered censorship. Third, third parties, such as certain nonprofit organizations, also worked as intermediaries to help the federal government effectuate its censorship scheme. This litigation in Missouri v. Biden offers it, the American people a unique window into the federal government's operation of what's now being called the censorship industrial complex. This litigation led by Missouri and Louisiana continues to unveil the extent of federal coercion and of collusion with tech companies to censor disfavored content. Of course, the censors have been wrong time and time again, but that's not the point here. The point we're trying to make is that the U.S. government is pressuring these platforms, which nearly every American use, uses every day, to censor speech. And whether you agree with the speech that's being shared or not, that doesn't matter. The only